I present Arnold Jacobs. I always had a question in my mind, and maybe you'd like to speak to this, Mr. Jacobs. Uh, we've heard about how you got started as a player, as a bugler, and uh, then trumpet player, and how method books were non-existent, and, and so forth. And that story uh, I've heard a few times. But I often, often wondered how you got interested in the study of the production of sound that you've made such a lifelong experience with. Would you like to speak to that? Want me to start at the beginning? Uh, sure. <laughs> it goes way back. While I was at the Curtis Institute of Music, I started there on a scholarship at the age of 15 and continued there to the middle of um, 1937. Uh, at that time, I was 21 and um, 22, I think, when I left. Almost seven years. While studying at the Curtis Institute of Music, I started to study voice. And um, I actually was offered a scholarship in the vocal department at the Curtis Institute of Music. And I was taking lessons from a um, tenor by the name of Luigi Bocelli. And uh, he's passed on. He was blind, but a very fine tenor voice. But um, he started working with me, and he had me forcing my voice so badly that I couldn't sing. I, I was constantly losing my voice through sore throats and telling me to support my tone. This is where we go right into respiration. And the efforts involved, based on his language, the use of words, I kept straining and working harder and harder. And uh, <clears throat> when I was offered a scholarship finally at the Curtis Institute, I turned it down because I found singing so unpleasant. I just love it today, but in those days, I didn't like the sore throats. But the language of support your tone and the terminologies were leading me into excessive physical efforts and contraction states. I didn't think of it along these lines back in the 30s when I was a very young man, but uh, I kept on singing because I loved it, but I just didn't formalize it with a teacher at the time. During the course of my stay at the Curtis Institute, Stokowski needed to have a group of 12 male voices from the Curtis Institute to sing the Stravinsky, Stravinsky King of the Stars. And they needed one more basso, and my solfege teacher, Madame McHale, recommended me to Stokowski uh, for the position as the fourth basso. And so I sang for Stokowski, and he accepted me. Uh, they, I don't think we ever put the performance on. I forget what happened, but they had to change the program for some reason. But anyway, I was accepted for the part, and they called me into the office at the Curtis Institute, <clears throat> and they said, this is your entrance into the vocal department. You can now put your tuba away and stay with us as a singer. And I thought of the sore throats, plus the fact that I used to like to go out and play jobs on string bass, jobs on tuba, sometimes trumpets and trombones and whatever in those days. I was having fun. So I turned the scholarship down because they said I would have had to give up the tuba and concentrate just on singing, and it would be an additional six, seven years at school, and I just was on the tail end of my six or seven years then. So I turned it down, but I continued to be interested in it. And this was actually what motivated me into um, working a bit on the study of breath. I wondered, why am I so comfortable playing the tuba and so miserable when I'm singing? And I did some professional singing in a radio station, WPEN in Philadelphia, and with quartets, some church singing at the Second Presbyterian with Alexander McCurdy. Mm -hmm. So I did some professional work as a singer, but I was never very comfortable with it. And I remember calling my wife's friend. My, my wife was very excellent in physiology. In the days when she was in high school, they had a physiology teacher, Calumet High School in Chicago, that really excelled. And she became very competent at the uh, medical drawings, the anatomy drawings. And so <clears throat> she was telling me, you know, we're talking about diaphragms, and I'm pointing at my navel and things. And she says, no, it's not there. It's up here. And she described the effect of the uh, domes of the diaphragm and how they descend and so forth. This is from my wife. She knew more about it. She's, she's a dancer. <clears throat> so anyway, she had a girlfriend that was a nurse and I decided I was going to look into this. And so I called her nurse mm -hmm. and uh, so then she sent me over a book of anatomy and physiology that the nurses use in their training. 
and I read through it, and I found it fascinating. And Dr. Margaret Buck, now we're going way back into the 40s, and um, I talked to her about my desire to learn a bit of structure and function. And anyway, she guided me through this period in terms of advising me on literature to have and uh, where to start. Study the skeletal structure first, learn about a bit of anatomy, but do it on a sensible basis. In other words, learn about the um, a, a structure. Don't just start with respiration. Learn what human beings are, how we're structured. I have plenty of time, and, and the interest was there. So anyway, I started a program which I thought would be of short duration. This is in 1944. This is now 1984, and I'm still at it. I've never stopped. The subject became so fascinating. When you study the structure and then the function of the human being, you do this for your lifetime and many future lifetimes, and the answers will still not be in. The subject is of enormous scope. And um, I went through the stages of studying the machine, the human machine. When I realized um, how little that meant, I had to start seeking out function. How are we controlled? In other words, what permits this to be a function? You then have to go into the nervous system. You have to go into the brain. You have to go into lifestyles and life patterns, body types, somatotypes, all sorts of things that you never expect to have to go into. This was just a never-ending study of enormous complexity. And if I had known of the complexity at the time I started, I probably would have closed the book and, and <laughs> said, no way, I would want to go fishing and, you know, have some fun. But uh, there was an ever-increasing fascination. And you can just see, if you want to help a person, you will find simple answers to complex situations. The complex answers do not fit the picture. It's like